Well, I'm absolutely delighted now to be joined by Dr. Margaret Geller. Dr. Geller, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you very much for taking the time to talk oh, to us today. Oh, it's certainly a pleasure. Today. Thank you. Now, it's great news. You, you won a very prestigious a, a award here last night. Tell us about the award and the research that you did to uh, win that award. Well, the award is given for uh, a major contribution to physics and for your ability to communicate physics to a wide variety of audiences and it's uh, an extraordinary honor to be in the long list of distinguished people who've received it. Um, it's particularly flattering to be the first observational cosmologist ever to receive it. Um, so what I do, I have a modest goal, it's to map the universe. <laughs> and um, I made some of the first maps of the way galaxies like our own Milky Way are organized in the local universe. And the remarkable thing is that they trace a very large pattern on scales of hundreds of millions of light years. And uh, the pattern is that galaxies are in very thin structures that surround or nearly surround vast empty regions that we call voids. And it's turned out that this structure, which is the basis for what we now call the cosmic web, is the typical structure of the universe, and it's what we seek to understand. We seek to understand how the structure forms, uh, what the matter is, because 80% of the matter in the universe is dark, so we know something about where it is and how galaxies trace it, but we don't know what it is. So what are, I mean, perhaps a foolish question, but, but with me, so what are some of the practical uses of your work? Well. To me, the most practical use is that we as human beings are unique in that we can ask questions about our grander environment. It's what makes us great. And societies that don't do that, die. <laughs> That's certainly true in history. And um, I think that it's remarkable that we can ask questions about the universe because it's not necessary that we would be a kind of creature that does. And what's even more amazing is that we can answer them, or some of them. And this is one of the things I try to communicate when I speak to the public, uh, how we do science, why we do it. And so I think that that's the high road answer to what's the practical consequence. The low road answer is, that in exploring the universe, we use the finest technology we know. So we use fiber optics, we use CCDs. Astronomy has been very important in the development of some of these technologies and in the development of image processing, in the development of uh, algorithms to look for uh, small samples in large data sets. And so that's something Google does all the time, or hedge fund managers do that all the time. So there are practical consequences, but in my view, that's the low road answer. <laughs> One of the things that you touched upon there was when you're talking to the, to, the, to the public. How important do you think it is for you to, to reach a wide audience? I think that it's crucial for scientists to explain to the public that supports them why we do science and how we do it. And when I've spoken to large audiences, and I've spoken to audiences of thousands of people at once, um, there is a certain thrill, I think, that people have in learning something that they can carry away with them and explain to somebody else. I think we as human beings love to tell stories, and the story of science is one of the stories that people like to tell if it's presented well. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice by not doing that more and by not rewarding the people who do it at the level that we should. You raised a really interesting point about uh, asking big questions. Yes. Do you think uh, America right now is in a position where it's, uh, where it's keen to ask big questions? I think there's some concern not only about the United States but about the world in general. There's, certain, there's a certain loss of imagination, I would call it. Um, there's a loss of the idea that we can ask and answer big questions, that these are things that transcend us as human beings, that this kind of exploration, this kind of understanding of nature is something that's much bigger than we are and it's something where we can compete and it's beautiful. And I think, and, it, and it's what makes us great. And I think that's what is really lost in these times. And I fear that and I think that scientists really have a duty 
to try to communicate that that's really why we do what we do. One of the other important things here is uh, is young people is reaching out to young people. I mean, how important is it for for your profession, for physics, to uh, reach out to young well, people? Well, science, of course, can't progress without young people wanting to go into it. And I think one of the problems we have now is that the kinds of opportunities that we're offering to young people are not what many young people who go into science seek. That as science becomes larger and larger and more and more corporate. The opportunities for young people to be creative and to follow their dreams are fewer, it seems, than what they were when I was starting out in science. And I think that a lot of young people find that very disappointing, and I think those of us who are senior in science have to worry about it. And I think it's related to this question that we discussed about the dream of understanding. And I think it applies not only to science, it applies to the arts, it applies to everything we do that makes us greater than we are as individuals. Well, thank you ever so much. Well, I could talk about this all day with you, but thank you ever so thank much. Thank you, Appreciate too. It, it was thank great. You. Thanks. Thank you.